So I want to thank uh, Sophie for making the journey over from London today to be with us and um, delighted to welcome her to speak. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you very much to Wendy and Epilepsy Ireland for inviting me to be here. I'm honoured to be invited and delighted as well. I am a Dublin woman. I'm living in London since 1998. I haven't lost my accent. It gets stronger every time I go back, and they would all tell me on Monday morning I'm sounding very Irish, and I'll be very proud of it. Um, I am the um, head of neuroscience medicine in Great Ormond Street Hospital and the lead for the epilepsy unit in the Children's Epilepsy Surgery Service. What I should say is that I see the children and the young people where the drugs have not worked. Um, most young people with epilepsy, the first drug they try will work. You get to 80-90% where two drugs will have worked. But many of you here in this audience will have experience of having been young people where the drugs did not work easily, where you did not grow out of it, or you will be parents of those children. So my talk comes from that background and that expertise. Um, so forgive me if at times I seem more serious, um, and I will be delighted to take questions at the panel afterwards. And if I say things that worry you in any way, please ask me, because they're not meant to be. But sometimes when you work in a specialist hospital, you don't realise if you say things that, that, that sound, sound quite deep. And here are my disclosures. So what I'm going to do is just a little reminder, because some of you in the audience will be adults with epilepsy, so may not, may not know where I'm coming from, the paediatric background, so a little bit of an introduction to that. Then I'm going to focus on what we call transitioning. Now, transitioning is all that period of time from 12, 13 years of age through paediatric services until, as a young adult, the person moves into adult services. I'm going to look at some specific issues that come up for us in our clinics a lot and share with you our expertise and our ideas, some of which will be very familiar to you and certainly Epilepsy Ireland is recognised internationally as a wonderful advocacy system and a wonderful group for providing information. So, But I hope there'll be something maybe new or that will lead you to look at the Epilepsy Ireland information and other details. And I'm going to share with you some of the things I consider to be opportunities at transition, things that your doctors should be thinking of for the young people around that period of time. So childhood epilepsy, children are difficult to adults. They're not little adults and vice versa. As a doctor, we think of epilepsy in what we call Acardi's apox. Acardi was a very famous French pediatric neurologist who we still turn back to and look at his look at his information. And he passed away um, a year in, earlier this year. The way we think is there are children whose epilepsy starts as little babies, and some of you will be parents of those children, where it can be a really rough ride, drugs don't work, other problems with learning and development. And then through childhood, the epilepsies that we use terms like benign. Benign to us means the drugs will work, school will go well, there's a good chance they'll grow out of it. And many of those, some of you may be here as parents of those children, and when they're adults, like Joan's daughter, it will be something that in influenced them but didn't, didn't, did not define them. And then there are the young people who the seizures come out, what we call the idiopathic generalised epilepsies. Seizures begin in teenage years, and they have to recognise that though the drugs should work, this is not something they may grow out of. This is something they will need to deal with. They will be people with epilepsy who have a life, a rest of a life, but it's something they need to know about. As your doctors, we need to be thinking of all those different groups. We need to be thinking about side effects that are different in children, in, in young adults. We have to be thinking about the way the drugs work. So when you speak to a paediatric epilepsy person, we'll have one view compared to the adults, and we share that. So don't ever worry if you get different responses, depending on the doctor you're talking to, because we're bringing our expertise in different areas. And we look after children who have complex epilepsy. As I said to you at the start, drug resistant. That means two good drugs used properly have not worked. And then you really, we want to think about why 
And that was that question that you heard from, from, from the young people with epilepsy, why me? So we are looking for the why, we're looking for the genetics, we're looking for an area in the brain that has not been formed correctly or has been scarred or damaged. We're looking for metabolic causes, chemical pathways in the body that aren't working properly. And we should really carefully, as your doctors, be thinking about what else the child or young person has. Do they have learning difficulties? Do they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Do they have autism? What the impact of those things are on their life? And encouraging them to see colleagues who have expertise in that area and ensuring they do not miss out on the treatments that they need for those areas because somebody says, well, get your epilepsy under control first and then come back to me and we'll talk about your ADHD. Do it all in parallel. And that's a really important thing that we should help with. So what is transitioning? What is happening with the young people? There are definitions of trans transition, and this is one from the Society of Adolescent Medicine in the USA, which is used regularly, and it's a good one. It's got some important words in it. Purposeful, planned, addressing medical, psychosocial, educational needs, moving from a child-centered to an adult-oriented environment. It's quite different being a child and having your mummy and daddy. In your teenage years, you kind of want to get rid of them, and a teenager wants to become an individual. Um, yeah, I think all of us in the room have been teenagers at some point. We try to remember back what it was. And you want to get independent from your parents. You want to establish your own relationships outside of your family group. And you want to find a vacation. What am I going to be when I grow up? As soon as you're leaving primary school, what are you going to be when you grow up? Are you going to be a doctor like your daddy? Are you going to be a farmer like your daddy? Are you going to be a doctor like your mummy in my house? Um, are you going to be a teacher? you've got to find your own identity and as a teenager maybe you might be rebelling against that and it's a vulnerable time it's a challenging time for young people regardless of having a chronic disease and we do term epilepsy as a disease because we need to take it seriously and you watch that young person in your clinic they come into you all happy when they're little they're showing you off their new lelly kelly's they're showing you their latest minecraft t-shirt and then they're getting a bit uncomfortable with you and the boy is starting to grow a beard and the girl is looking around exactly at that in the waiting room thinking mm, you know all these babies and buggies etc and they're beginning to be uncomfortable and and as the consultant i'm the establishment i'm the authority figure they'll talk to my nurse specialist and the nurses are absolutely invaluable and the desire for confidentiality who gets my letter who knows about it do i really want to have this conversation with my mum in the room so we begin to give them opportunities where do you want to be seen without your mum and dad they usually say no it's fine do you want to see the nurse without your mum and dad oh yes please and that's when they'll have the proper conversations that's tough when you're the mum and dad you can see the poor the poor parents going oh <laughs> what are they going to say i need to know i need to know but actually that letting go is so important and it's really good for your doctors to let go and to begin planning all these changes throughout the time. Because if you get this wrong, if the young person doesn't like what's happening, they don't come to their appointments, you will get lost in follow-up. If as doctors we don't plan to move those young people onto a good adult service, they get lost in transition. That's the phrase that we use. Um, and we, we as professionals and you as parents and as people with epilepsy have to make sure that we don't get to forget about your young people, what we call the collusion of anonymity. Because for a lot of people, it's actually a kind of a scary time looking after adolescents. Um, my kids are currently six and eight years of age. They still think we're wonderful. And they still, they run out to see us as we come in the door. But the teenage years are something else. And I think about the grief that, you know, all of myself and my siblings gave to our parents growing up. So what can I share with you? And there are wonderful examples in Ireland, but I'm sharing with you my experience in the practice that, that, where I work. At Great Ormond Street, we are literally next door to um, Queen Square. So Queen Square in epilepsy worlds is a really, really, really major adult neurology and neurosurgery centre. So that kind of co-location makes things very good. So we work really closely with our adult colleagues there. And we do have um, a transition programme. Now, there are different models of care. And depending on where you live and work in the world, different models may be open to you. Some places, it's directly to the GPs. 
and um, there are GPs who have particular interest in this area. Depends, it's very patchy in the UK as to whether that would work or not. Years ago, we paediatricians, we did not like to say goodbye to our parents, our, our patients and the parents were still the same. And when things were very rare, young people stayed under paediatrics. Or it was just a letter. Dear friend next door in the adult hospital, please take over this patient. But actually, what we advocate and what is recommended by the NICE guidelines, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which is a body in the UK who produces national guidelines for many, many different disorders, is a dedicated joint clinic. And that's what we actually offer. And what we do, and I want you first to look at that yellow box at the bottom, transition begins long before this roughly 12 years of age it's 10 for some 10 years for some they're getting awfully advanced and starting things early these days um, or it could be slightly later when you're ready but we begin around 12 we start planning this and um, what I'll talk to you about in the current issues is some of that planning but we're bringing them towards what is then a handover clinic and what we do is it is a disease focused model it means this is a clinic for young people with epilepsy between the age of 16 and 18 and at that clinic is the adult neurologist there's myself as the paediatric neurologist. Our nurse comes over, so that the faces are there, the familiar people that they know. We bring all the notes, all the records, and there's just such relief on the parents' faces when they see the big, big, deep Great Ormond Street notes, etc., because they know it's all being passed on. And if we discover we're missing something, like the important genetic report or the MRI scans or anything, I can go get that and send it on. So nothing gets lost. It all gets handed over. But way before that, we have to start addressing the specific issues. And we kind of term them loosely, our teenage talks. And our nurse, pra nurse practitioners and nurse specialists have a semi-structured approach, a kind of a programme, things that they're, that they're dealing with, workbooks, information sheets, and they do this with the teenagers on a one-to-one -one basis. As much as the teenagers are ready for, they judge it depending, depending on the teenager. And they begin to have those kind of what we term the sort of the sex, drugs and rock and roll talks with them. But really it's all about keeping safe when you're out and about. We talk about the impact of late nights because sleep deprivation is a trigger for epilepsy for many of the young people. So learning what their triggers are is very important. We talk about alcohol and recreational drugs because though as parents we might not like to think that our kids are doing it we probably should cast our minds back to what we used to call in Dublin in my day knacker drinking which was where you had a oh there's a few nods around the audience that kind of two litre of cider under a bridge my mother would kill me because I denied it all I was such an angel um, but but jokes aside you have to think about it and some of the important things is for for our young people to know if you're on anti-epileptic drugs you get drunk sooner so it's you can't be in a round system you can't be doing one for one with your with, with the other lads you have to pace yourself and the recreational drugs we do we do all worry about those because almost all of them are more likely to trigger off a seizure and and that kind of brings you on to sort of the whole kind of vulnerability of if you have a seizure, you know, do your friends know you have epilepsy? Um, and if you miss your drug doses, because alcohol itself doesn't give you a seizure. It's the fact that you throw up your drugs the next morning or you're sleep deprived or you sleep late and you don't take your medicines or you're out somewhere and you don't get back. So we start to encourage them to have a couple of doses in their wallet, in their back pocket with them, you know, wherever they keep their mobile phone, you know, keep a couple of doses of your medicine with you in case, in case you, you miss the last night bus home. Um, and we talk about contraception. That's where, you know, often sort of it gets sort of phrased along the lines of sort of heavy periods. But actually, the girls are starting to have periods, and what, you don't want them to be miserable when they have really bad stomach ache, pains, etc. And someone says to them, oh, you can't take paracetamol, you can't take Nurofen because you're on other drugs. So we talk about all those issues, and we talk about pregnancy, because, you know, 14, 15, 16 years of age, they could become pregnant. And we talk about actually planning pregnancy, and we talk about the possible effects of drugs on an unborn fetus. Um, and actually just the importance of, of, of considering them in advance. But really, we have to stress that they must not stop their drugs suddenly. Because if the message goes out there, oh, you know, you don't want to be any, on any drugs when you're pregnant, there's a big risk to our young girls to trigger off their seizures. 
So what we want them to do more than anything else is to tell somebody that they trust. Go and see their GP. Go and see somebody if they think they're pregnant. And then an ally to that is genetic counselling. As we're discovering the genetics more and more, in the adult clinic, as they come in, suddenly the boy that I've looked after since he's 12 or 13 is coming in with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's pregnant. Or she comes in with her little baby, which is absolutely wonderful, but then some of them do have specific genetic mutations they know, so we have to let them know what the ch chances are, and if anything happens with their little baby, who they need to see and what to do. So activities. Absolutely, completely echoing what Joan said to you. Really, we just want to encourage our young people to be getting out there doing things. Driving is a big thing. The rules and regulations vary from country to country, but we have to be really clear on those when you can drive. And actually, the, the preconception is that um, the young people think they cannot drive because they have epilepsy. So they're delighted when they hear you can if your epilepsy is under control. And that's a really good incentive to taking your medications if you want to get a driving license. We absolutely encourage them to swim, to play sports. The only two things that I say to them I really don't want them to do, one is diving. Because if you are even 10 metres under the ground, you can see the shining light above you. But if something happens, any of you have ever been scuba diving, and slightest little discognitive function, slightest whatever, and the regulator falls out of your mouth and take a big gulp of seawater, you're finished. So the other thing is solo skydiving. Jump out of, a, out of a plane with your lovely parachute, anything happens, you don't pull your, pull your string, you're in trouble. So you can do tan tandem diving. But other than that, absolutely, we want them to do everything. They ski, they play, play rugby, they play you know, football, we've had like gymnasts, everything. We want them to do it all. Gap years. They, you know, when I went to the UK first in 1998, everybody was going to gap year. You didn't do a gap year in Ireland in the 1990s. But I know that gap years have now kind of come in and travelling, etc., everywhere. They have to know if they're going the gap year. Can you get your medicines in that country? Have you got enough going with you? Have you got the right letters for the airline? What are you going to do if you have a big seizure? Does your travel insurance repatriate you, bring you back to your, to your, your home country? So it's kind of stuff like that, just reminding them, encouraging them to go. We've had young guys go and climb Kilimanjaro, um, work, in, in, you know, work, work in, 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 in projects in resource poor countries. We want them to do it. We just want to help them to get there. And medical alert bracelets, whatever it is, dog tags, um, friendship bracelets, something that identifies. And that's the real worry in, in a lot of our minds for the young people who go out if they have a lot to drink. You know, we've all heard those scary stories that are true about a young lad, 18 years of age, has a seizure, thrown in a, a police cell that, you know, the, sort of people think, oh, you're just drunk and actually he's had a seizure. And then the young girls in particular, we worry somebody will take advantage of them. It sounds a kind of a serious thing to say, but it is. It's every parent's worry. And we say it straight up to our young people and they understand it. They get it. We always think about their other, uh, other issues. And one of the kind of issues that, as doctors, we've often been shy of talking about, and that's SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. It's rare. It's really rare. They're more likely to be hit by a bus, but it's real. And there will be people in this audience who have had first-hand experience of that. So it's important. And actually, the conversation we're having is, is in the positive context of, you're going you know, to move away for college, for university. You're going to li live with other people. So it's about encouraging them to tell the people they live with. So if they hear something funny at night time, they check on them. Um, and actually, what the poor old parents kind of go, ooh, at, as we say, is, you know, the best protection against SUDEP for the young people is having somebody sleeping with them, which was at 10 and 12 years of age, their mum or dad, but let's, hmm, think so. But, but actually, it's, it's important, and it's raising awareness. And that's something that groups like Epilepsy Ireland do so well and know how to talk about in such a sensitive way. School, all the way through the teenage years. Primary school, your teacher knew you, you had extra help. Suddenly you go into a big senior school with like four or five different groups within the year, moving classroom all the time. It's tough. And we often find around about 12, 13 years of age, that's when our young people may start to have behavioural problems, difficulties, rebelling. 
and they might even be good as gold in school and then come home and absolutely decompensate because it is so stressful. It's stressful without having epilepsy. And what we try to really encourage is for young people to, 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 to accept help. They don't want to be different. But there may be, you know, if, if identified functions with processing executive function may be able to get additional time in state exams. You know, it's all worth exploring. It's very, very, very important for their careers, their lives, their hopes and their aspirations. And career guidance. You know, almost every career is open to young people with epilepsy. In the UK, the forces, the army, the air force, they are areas that particularly the young boys come in and talk to us about. Um, plenty of, plen plenty of our, our, our bright young people want to do medicine um, and actually most medical careers are completely open to them as well with all the issues of sleep deprivation and all the other things that come with a medical training. But yeah, so it's, it's quite important. I've had to often give advice to people on engineering courses, working with heavy machinery. So it is, it, it, it is important. And all those school trips, their peers, role models for them, that's tough because a lot of epilepsy is so common and yet so few people in the public eye and the media in general want to talk about their medi me medical problems and that's you know confidentiality is an issue but they need role models and trying to find good role models for them is really really important and it's so lovely to hear Joan talking about her daughter and what she's doing and it's like that is it's hearing about people who what they've done as they got older. So one of the big issues is around compliance about taking your medications. You're a teenager, you don't want to take medicine. Hey, you're an adult, most of you in the audience, and you don't want to take your medications, whether it's your medicine for your hypothyroidism or your reflux or your asthma inhaler. We don't like taking them. But the type of things that make it really, really help is actually going to take the medicine yourself, not having your mother being the person who's like, have you taken your medicine? Have you brushed your teeth? You know, do you remember to pack your bag? Um, you know, as we all do. Um, but actually, the difference is, is if they do it themselves, they trust themselves, and apps. I mean, mobile phones have changed things. You know, the whole kind of business about getting the story of the epilepsy. The first thing I say, have you any videos of it? So absolutely, those, those phones, those videos, you know, as Peter said to you in the introduction this morning, what you can do on your phone, and apps are great. And if they don't have an app, if you haven't, you know, if your phone isn't one of those singing or dancing things, um, just setting a timer that goes off every morning, you know, a reminder, a little beep, beep, beep that says, time to take your medicine. Things like that can make a big, big difference. And mental health, absolutely. We, as professionals, must not ignore it. And the young people, we've got to encourage them, and you as parents or as people with epilepsy, to be aware that if you do have epilepsy, it is a disease of the brain. The brain does lots of other wonderful, great things, but the brain gets sad and the brain gets happy. And mood disorders are more likely. Um, anxiety is more likely. And that can be helped. My goodness, our psychiatry colleagues can treat more things probably than most other people in medicine, apart from orthopedic surgeons um, who, can, who can fix bones beautifully. And I've kind of, as I've talked so far, really talked more about the sort of the more able young people. But a lot of young people with epilepsy have got learning disabilities. And we must not forget that. We must think about ways to support them through their teenage years. And there are real questions for their parents. Is my child going to be able to grow up and live independently? Do I need to look at institutional living? What are the social supports that can go in? What's going to happen when I'm gone? And capacity. What I mean by capacity is, does that young person have, have the ability to make a decision for themselves? And we need to absolutely recognise that. Because that young person has learning disabilities, it does not mean they don't have an opinion and a view that counts which drug that they want to choose, what side effects they consider tolerable or not, whether they would like to try other treatments such as surgery, ketogenic diet, vagus nerve stimulation therapy. Listen to them. And one of the nicest things when I do that shared clinic with my adult neurology colleagues is when they talk so well to the young person. As paediatricians, we're so used to talking to the mums and dads. We have to remind ourselves to talk first to the young person. The poor mums and dads, when they come into that clinic and they get ignored for the first five minutes, you can just see them sitting there with their notebook and their details going, I want to tell you, I want to tell you. And they're being ignored intentionally with the best of in, best of reasons because that young person might have learning disabilities but they are a person and they have their views and their views are important 
So what do we do with our young people with epilepsy? We set them goals that are appropriate to their level of learning. So from as they go from the age 12, 13, 14, it might be the next time you come in, you're going to tell me what time of the day you take your medicine. The next time you come in, you're going to tell me, is it a liquid you're on? Is it a bottle? Or are they tablets? The next time you come in, it'll be like, yeah, for the last month, couple of months, I'm helping my mom and dad put them in my wallet, put them in the boxes. Remembering to remembering the names. I mean, that's a big step. What are the names of your medicine? You know, as parents, you know every medicine's name that your children are on. But if someone said to you, what's the name of the medicine you're on? Oh, the heart tablet, the blue one, the red one. The, but, you know, so actually it's a big deal learning the names. And telling your friends you have epilepsy, talking about what happens in your seizures. Those kind of things, they're, they're big steps forward and they're all about learning independence. And what's really, really important as well to talk about is number 10, your body is changing, you know, and, and, and looking after it. So it's actually some of the biggest, biggest thing to be proud of coming back into my clinic would be, you know, I have a shower every day, you know, and that's actually, those kind of things are just enormously important and looking after yourself as your body changes and you become a young adult. And so there are, these are the opportunities in that transition period, the things that we can help to do and things that we can do in looking back and thinking about epilepsy. So as well as those specific issues, it's time for your paediatrician to revisit your child's investigations or you if you're a young person. It's time for your paediatrician to give a fresh look at your treatment and your adult neurologist when you meet them to look at things fresh. And we should look at the imaging, that's the MRI scans, the CT scans, the EEG, and the genetics, which have exploded in the last five years. I looked after a young man, came to me when he was 12. He was having what were thought to be nightmares. They weren't nightmares. They were frontal lobe seizures. We, 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 we look really carefully in our program to make sure that we're not missing a chance for epilepsy surgery, which can cure young people and, and adults and children. His EEG said to us, it comes from all over the place. His MRI scan then, we could not find anything on it. The drugs worked, but then they kind of stopped working. And when he came to see my adult neurology colleagues, the technology had moved on and the story had changed. And now when they did the EG, it, we could tell that it came from the left side of his brain. And now when they did the MRI scan, when they looked more carefully, they could begin to see that there were areas of abnormality on that side. And he then went on to have successful epilepsy surgery so, and became seizure free. So it's really worthwhile thinking, has the technology moved on? I might have thought about epilepsy surgery for that child when they were five years of age. 10, 15 years later, what could I, should I look again? Should I consider that again? And the genetics, the genes have completely changed. 10 years ago, we did chromosomes. Now we do something called an array CGH and panels of genes. These really, really apply to mostly babies and infants but now children so as you look at that screen down your left hand side there's a list of different genes and we are beginning to connect them with all sorts of epilepsy syndromes and if you're 15 16 17 years of age you wouldn't have had these gene panels done because they weren't available when you were a baby they're new so now that's the chance to think about actually do we have a diagnosis can we find the specific reason can we can we inform the future are there new drugs that target those particular mutations and that's the way it's going it's not completely there but absolutely the understanding of those and the drug options and the drug side effects are different lamotrigine keeps adults awake at night time children snooze away with it so it's kind of understanding those changes in side effects and thinking as well about the new drugs so something which isn't being used in children you know, the new drugs that have come out on the market. What can we offer? What can we try? And can we think about the ketogenic diet? You know, it's, it's, it's a great treatment for epilepsy. Um, it's not an easy treatment. It's not a natural diet by any means. And it used to be the kind of thing that really was, was reserved for little children whose mummies would do all the cooking. Um, some families, the dads look at me when I say that because they do the cooking too. In my house, I do the cooking. Um, and they 
But what's really changed is for adults, for young adults, mo- a modified Atkins type diet approach. The m- recipes have improved so much. And only now are the adult neurologists beginning to espouse this and realize this is another good treatment for young people with epilepsy. So it's time to think about that and revisit it. And if you haven't before considered vagus nerve stimulation, if the drugs aren't working, if the diet hasn't worked, or if it's just not practical, because sometimes it isn't, um, or if surgery isn't a way forward, what about vagus nerve stimulation therapy? It can be a really, really good treatment for young people. And the newest devices are terribly clever. So for those of you who don't know about this, it's a non-drug treatment for epilepsy. You implant a device under the skin, a bit like a pacemaker. There is a lead tunneled underneath the skin and wrapped around the vagus nerve on the left side of the neck. It produces pulses of electrical activity, which over a year, take six months a year to show benefit, begin to calm down and change the chemical environment deep in the brain and make seizures less likely to happen. The latest version on the market is terribly clever. It actually monitors heart rate. And for probably up to 25% of young adults and adults with epilepsy, there's a jump up in the heart rate when a seizure starts. And it picks up the jump up in the heart rate, which is called ictal tachycardia. And on demand, it stimulates. So on demand, magnetic stimulation is what it does. And in our early days, we think we're beginning to see extra benefits from this device, but the technology is always changing. There are other types of brain stimulation coming out. So it's a real chance in the teenagers and in the move to adult services to think what else is available when we started looking after this young person 10 or 15 years ago. What have I got new? What have I forgotten? I need to think again. So to finish up, teenage years, adolescent, is a time of challenge for the young person, for the family, for the doctors and nurses that look after them. But it's a challenge that we can rise to because it's a time of opportunity for those young people with epilepsy. And good transition processes are what we as professionals should offer to you, you as families and young people advocating for yourselves should ask of us to prepare the young person for moving on to adulthood. Just to finish, to my acknowledgements, Professor Cup and Professor John Duncan at the National are my colleagues that I work with in the transition. Our clinical nurse specialist, Emma Ninnis, does a huge amount of work with the young people. And my colleague, Dr. Sarah Aylett, in the epilepsy unit at Great Ormond Street, has specific expertise in epilepsy in young people with learning difficulties. Thank you. <laughs>